Hello, one and all. Welcome to this 2024 edition of 31 on 31, brought to you by the crew at Autop Stream. I'm joined, as always, by Sean Chandler, Cody Leach, Brian Lomax, and Rudy over at Gen X Reviews. This year, we're doing much in the theme of 2024. We're covering voices behind the camera, less so franchises in front of it. That's not to say that there aren't franchises in this 31, but it's more about 14 filmmakers within the new breed, directors in the 21st century that have added something to the horror landscape recently. Without further ado, let's get right to it. Number 31. So number 31 for me is Terrifier. I hate to be the grouch here, or more so, I, I hate to be agreeing with Brian from what I think. I'm not that wowed and won over by the Terrifier franchise. And part one is something that I wouldn't have predicted what happened in the last five years from seeing that movie. It's extremely flawed to me. It's cheap, it's low rate. The story really doesn't matter. I know the story doesn't matter in Friday the 13th, but here it's just really out in front that decisions just don't make sense. And it's it's kind of this anomaly movie and things don't matter. It's gore for the sake of gore, which they do get better at, and obviously. Otherwise they would be lower. If I don't ever watch it again, I'm all right with that. For as gross and gory as this movie is, it just doesn't really work for me and that's why it's here um this is a weird year because there are movies that i well let's just go ahead and get to 30. 30 is the black coat's daughter and um wow this is as low as it is because it's boring. There's like this weird edit in this movie where it just feels like there's two separate stories and they were shot at separate times and none of them really climax together and it, it just happens. One of my biggest gripes for movies are to be boring and irrelevant. I, I would rather something wow me while not enjoying it, at least being entertained and excited in some way, which I, I would technically give Terrifier over this. But Black Coat's Daughter, I just didn't care. The only reason I finished this movie was because we were covering it. Could not be more mentally checked out. But this is such a different experience than Terrifier. I guess there's a bit to the story that makes more sense than Terrifier. It's hard to gauge these movies because I wouldn't put these two movies in the same category for, for a lot. Um, but we're talking about 21st century horror filmmakers, and this would be a time where I would consider that. So... <laughs> Number 29, a new one, Never Let Go. It feels like something we've seen before, you've seen before, I've seen before, with a bit of a twist to it. It feels a lot like The Village to me at points. There are moments where you can kind of see where this movie's going, does something you're expecting, and also takes like a cheap way out at times. Um, something I'm guilty of every year is some sort of recency bias. And I might be considerably harder on this movie than I would be, say, a year from now. But I've only had one viewing of this and it hasn't really sat with me for very long. It only just came out last month. It just didn't feel like the journey was worth it. Or, I don't know, fun? <laughs> Number 28, Oculus. Huh. The problem with the, the bottom half of these movies, or most of them, are they're movies that just lost my attention at some point during the movie, and Oculus is certainly guilty of that. A lot of these movies in the back 10, you know, 21 through 31, there are movies that I feel like second tier um, horror movies that you would show to, I don't know, somebody who didn't like slashers or, you know, Brian movies. <laughs> but Oculus, without really jumping out and doing anything for you, I mean, other than eating a light bulb, not much about this movie sticks with me. And um, it's just rinse next. which can also be said for Ouija Origin of Evil. It's fine. It feels like something along the lines of like The Conjuring and that universe of movies, again, doesn't really jump out and grab my attention and 
have anything that's really noteworthy about it where I'm rah-rah. A lot of these movies in, in this little section, I would not suggest to people to watch. So there's that. I mean, we're talking about 14 filmmakers at this point. Um, a lot of them have done some spectacular work, um, but when you have to fill a slate, you, you've got to gather some movies that maybe aren't five-star products. And um, this is one of them. Ouija Origin of Evil is not something that I would run out and tell people that they need to see. I mean, I don't even think of the entirety of the Ouija franchise, but here, here we are. <laughs> Number 26, Terrifier 3. Really good effects work. Art the Clown, David Howard Thornton is incredible. Like this movie transcends humor. He's definitely got the charisma to be this star that he appears to be right in front of our eyes in the horror community. Same thing can be said for Lauren Lavera's Sienna. I feel like the steps they take with her character in this movie is a little different. Not so much a hero's journey this time, more of a, a wounded warrior, for lack of a better definition. Part of the problems with the Terrifier franchise, while not being gore or FX, is storytelling. There's a moment in Terrifier 3 where you see Art the Clown have this moment of like innocence when he meets Santa Claus. I thought it was an interesting place to go with that character, only for it to not really be a thing at all. And then it just goes back to Art killing everything in sight. I would have really enjoyed, I, I don't know, I, I would have welcomed the ride, whatever they were trying to take me on, if we had some element of art that we hadn't seen, like this genuine joy in Santa. It just teases that for a hot second, but the fault of the Terrifier franchise is storytelling. And for as much as I think there's a lot of good in this movie, I would go back to this for like clips. These aren't movies that I would run back to and watch start to finish. 25 is Dead Silence. Again, a lot of these movies in this back end of this ranking for me, I guess we take for granted. If this were 25 years ago, uh, I would have a bit more love and I'd be a bit more enamored with, with films like this. But because horror is doing so well recently, things like Dead Silence just kind of, just, there's nothing really tremendously wrong with this movie. It just doesn't win me over too much with anything that's happening. It, it's, it, it's a very straightforward, cursed doll, oh, big reveal in the third act. Um, there's, there's more to it than just a cursed doll. And the zombie lady should have a bit more attention, but there's all souls. Um, it's, I don't, I don't wanna demean the project and say it's, it's paint by numbers, but the reveal isn't as big a deal to me for this movie and a couple of other of these movies. It's fine, it's not something that I would hang my hat on and say, oh, we, we need to watch this. Which is something I could certainly say for Crawl. Sure, flooded house and there's a problem. I, I, I don't know how to define Crawl. It feels like it's got a lot of ideas. Very easy for me to forget. Like I remember having certain moments that were thrilling to me, but putting things like gators, crocodiles, I don't know which one's which. The sea demon in this film, it felt like a bit much, like drowning alone was was certainly enough to get me freaked out. But I guess you, you need the sea demons to make things worse. I just felt like they were trying to outdo themselves for the sake of extra thrills. I mean, you have something like The Shallows that came out that had a similar thing and didn't have to make such compact. We're not talking about shallows. Crawl is, is fine. A lot of these movies are fine. They're just not things that I would run back to and say, oh, oh boy, we, we need to watch this. 23, Infinity Pool. Now this movie certainly, certainly breaks some of the monotony 
the sameness that I feel a lot of these movies, the last five or six movies I've been talking about have. This is Cronenberg weirdo shit. At the very least, it grabs you. I think it's funny because a lot of people talk about Mia Goth's performance in this and the, the one scene that everybody points to. Yeah! If anything, that moment for me really kind of grinds me up where I don't know if the, like that's her real accent or like she's putting that accent on or like needing to scream with a put on accent. It just it just it hits me the wrong way. And here everyone is talking about how great that scene is. And I can't take that scene seriously when she's yelling and being all haunting. But I'm haunted for the wrong reasons. But Wild Movie really certainly fucking next level Cronenberg shit. And the idea of just fucking up and, and having a, a clone. There's a lot of rich people class things happening there. This is one of the first movies that I would probably say, yeah, let's let's check that out again, because there's something to it that I'd, I'd like to pick apart a bit more. 22, Midsommar. The further away I get from this movie, I've watched it twice since it's been out. Once when it came out and once in the last three or four months. It doesn't sit with me the same way it did when I first watched it. And folk horror is something that maybe I don't really get down with. It's unique, it's gorgeous, but it's something that I probably wouldn't go to on a repeat viewing. It, like, I, I've got it. There's a bunch of movies here where there's unpleasant imagery, a lot of beauty with ugly things on the screen happening. I know some people enjoy or will be entertained by thrillers and horrors like that. I'm all set with that. My definition for the comedy series was movies that I would go to to laugh. This 31, I think it might just be rewatchability for me because I, I can recognize this movie's good, but I don't know if, if I ever feel the need to rewatch this again, unless it's for something as fun as this. Number 21 is Possessor. Yet another Cronenberg movie that I would choose not to watch it, but if I had to, again, I probably would. It's a disturbing movie. These movies between Infinity Pool, this, and Papa Cronenberg, all their films, I watch things like this and I wonder what Thanksgiving or Christmas is like at their house because that makes me kind of weirded out like what type of people are these that dad came out and made movies like this and junior has come out and made equally bizarro confusing head trippy things like do they ever just talk about the weather and have a normal conversation is my question i didn't really talk about the movie that much did i yeah there's a lot of movies on this list that i i just opt to not think about if I don't have to. This list scarred a lot of us. It scarred Brian for certain reasons. It scarred me for different reasons. Number 20 is Terrifier 2, my favorite in the Terrifier franchise. So part of my problem with part three is there's things that happen in part two that get introduced and just kind of abandoned. All of the Terrifier movies, if you're watching them in like separate doses, you know, just individually, they're their own thing but terrifier 2 is perhaps the longest but it feels the most i don't know i really feel bad for lauren lavera she does a fantastic job in this movie and it has nothing to do with the fact that she looks a lot like emily maybe it has a little bit to do with that but as far as outside of something like art the clown sienna is a character that is a bit of a bigger deal than this movie. Like the performance is something that sticks with you a bit more than the lack of story within this movie. Again, it's a terrifier movie. The gore is just legendary. It sticks with you. That bedroom scene, wow. But part of my problem with this, the rewatchability of this is the story, especially considering that there's a, the little girl just isn't really a thing. Art gets, his head chopped off and it doesn't really matter. I don't mind in the land of slashers if, if things don't really connect well, but if it feels like none of it matters, I kind of lose interest. These movies, 
are just kind of gore for the sake of gore. The one thing that I would give part two is like the hero's journey that like the absolute badass, I don't know, final girl nature of Sienna's character kind of gets, they take away from the success with the Sienna character in two, in three. And I'm not really trying to say that three ruins how I feel about two, but I don't know. I, I If you told me that I would think less of three than two after watching this without seeing a frame of three, I, I would kind of be well, disappointed what I am. It's as good a time as I could imagine for movies that I just am not really a fan of where the story does or does not go. You got a scream queen there and needs better scripts to work with. All right, maybe now I'm kind of referencing the fact that she looks a dead ringer for Emily. <laughs> Number 19 is Smile 2. This movie is fantastic for me. I watched this movie. This is the most recent movie I've watched. Uh, it's the most recent release. I had heard that Cody wasn't really into it. And for about an hour, I remember thinking internally, Cody's crazy. This is quite awesome. This is engaging. This is deep. This is fucked up. And for as much as this movie is another one that's not really fun to take part in, like this is everything that sucks about trauma. But for the third act of the movie, they really waste a lot of the steps that they take with the first hour half. It seems like for the third act, they just kind of throw everything they can at you and some things feel irrelevant because we need to wrap this up somehow. And it kind of takes some of the, the punch away from that movie. And the cinematography is fantastic. The opening shot is awesome, but it just doesn't work when you start thinking about things that are happening. 18, Sinister. Yeah, I don't know how I'm going back to movies that feel like they're kind of middle of the pack things from the Conjuring era, but that's kind of what this is. And this is a bit more solid than the ones in the 20s for me. For as much positive as I have to say for things like Terrifier 2 or Smile 2, this is a bit more fluid. It doesn't have very many big peaks, but it's just solid. It doesn't really have that many valleys either. So this is a bit more of a neutral experience, whereas some of the movies I've listed already have better moments for me, but negatives are a bit lower than I'd like them to be, and certainly lower than something like this. Which uh, gets to, nope, something of a sci-fi movie. It's kind of hard when you're doing these lists to not have complete horror, but yeah, Jordan Peele's Nope. This is my least favorite from Jordan Peele. The ideas are are cool. It's just a movie that after watching it again, I appreciate some of the things that are done in this movie, certainly. It feels like some of like the, the monkey, the shoe. There's some things in this movie that happen like just to kind of fuck with you. I'm all right if I never see this movie again. It's well made, just as far as the future is concerned. No thanks. Good stuff, just not that entertained by it, which isn't really fair for a lot of these movies because some of them are just okay, like eating bread. Just, yep, all right, that nourished some sort of need where some of these are a bit more entertaining, like sugar, and some of these are, you know, they're good for you. Some of them are like wheat. Who wants to eat wheat? Unless, of course, you're Zack Snyder. Which brings me to Malignant. This is probably the first movie that, for the record, all of these movies, none of them are really anything below a star and a half. 31 for me is maybe at 1.5, maybe two out of five. So to give you an idea of, of what 
16 on this list is for me. This is like a three, three and a half star movie for me. But this is like the first time on this list where it feels fun. It's a little silly. It's a little out there. I think, I mean, I'm sure the movie knows that. I guess we fall into some sort of groove every year. And I think my thing this year was I felt kind of down for a lot of these movies where it's like I wouldn't voluntarily go back and watch again. And then when you have something like Malignant, it's it's like this, this breath of fresh air, a, this silly movie that is silly and it's... It's not something serious at all. And it's still quite entertaining. I don't know what that says, that I would much rather watch something like Malignant than Nope. I can tell you 10 times out of 10 that Nope is a is a better made experience, but I would rather have an experience like Malignant. It's just, it's silly. It's, it's fun. And sometimes well, I, I need that. Number 15 is Maxine. So the thing that I thought maybe I was crazy with was Ty West. Leading into X and Pearl, his older stuff like Innkeepers, things like that, I can't really get with his older work. Maybe, maybe I'm the problem. After Maxine, maybe I'm not the problem. It's fine. It's a nice wrap up to the X trilogy, but it is the most inferior, which isn't saying an incredible amount for me. We're halfway there. I just feel like the third act really just kind of steamrolls through and gets to something that isn't really that big a reveal. If you've watched the movies in order, it doesn't feel like a horror movie. Like I get it. The f X is old school slasher. Pearl is a tribute to just old school cinema outright. And this is just the 80s VHS things. I don't know. Th this, to me, trends a bit more with Ty West when I think of his work. Good, but could be better. 14. Long Legs. Yeah, so uh, another 2024, darling. A lot of the movies from 2024, I, I do have recency bias one way or another. I mean, if I did this list two years from now, it, 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 the, the new releases would be probably far different and in far different places. So take that with a grain of salt. But Long Legs, I saw after all of the ridiculous hype. The things that I had issue with were like the, the Zodiac element that ended up being a, something of a red herring. Some of the, the Nicolas Cage gimmicks, like the shots were not the best part for me. And the third act felt something rather trippy. I don't know how to compare this movie. It feels like Silence of the Lambs, Zodiac, and I, I, I don't have the third element, but it's it's really wild. And the third act kind of slaps you in the face because you're preparing for this like crime thriller thing. And then it does this religious slap in the face for the third act. And it, it's it's wild. I, I'm the way I'm not impressed with Black Coat's daughter. I was rather impressed with Long Legs, although I had this bizarre expectation of five out of five movie and that kind of i guess it ruined my experience even though it's it's in my top half i enjoyed it but i felt like it was a letdown considering what everybody was saying about it it's a shame that we don't go into all of these with the same expectations because i probably would have felt better about this if i went in blind now, how do you do that 13 is Don't Breathe, another fun movie that you think one person is the villain or one group are bad people. And then you, you kind of get this, oh, wait, everybody's kind of messed up. And then it gets worse. And to think of this movie as just like, oh, trapped in a house with a blind guy, like it's the third act of, or like the, the climax of Silence of the Lambs, but not unlike something like Crawl. This I feel like is a bit more heightened and it has a bit more happening to it. So I, I don't know, I'm contradictory even even right now. The way Crawl just feels like, yeah, here's a thing and we're just gonna cram more shit in there. This feels like it actually heightens the fact that, yeah, you're in a house with a blind guy and the reveals are a bit more tragic and things are fucking crazy and then you, you find out someone's in the basement and nobody is a good person in this movie it's an entertaining and thrilling ride which considering how many of these movies are just very not that it's a shame that the second one didn't go as hard as this one did number 12 is us 
Yeah, Jordan Peele, I feel like his ideas are much bigger than his execution. This is a four-star movie for me, so I like whatever refinement you want to put on my comments. This is a hell of an idea. It's not unique. If you're familiar with Twilight Zone, you're familiar with, with some aspects of this story. The moments that kind of fuck with you, they're effective. They're certainly effective. It's entertaining. The, the guy's got a great eye, and this, unlike Nope, is something that I, I kind of enjoy going back to, even though I have gripes and there's some things that I've felt and it doesn't feel completely original, but there are aspects to it that I, I quite enjoy. And anytime you can use the the beach from Lost Boys, I don't know, you, you get an extra five points from me. Number 11 is Ready or Not, Radio Silence. They are the, the antidote to this misery batch. For as much as we have some some downer movies in this list, the Radio Silence movies are fun, silly, action-packed, and they do the gore the way Terrifier does, but has more fun somehow. Like, I don't know if that's a fair comparison because Terrifier is just gory to, to hell. Ready or not, and the other film, they have gore quite a bit. There are different movies on this list that deal with class and what rich people do and what poor people do and how we uh, interact with one another. And this movie kind of takes the piss out of that high class culture and uh, how, how little they think of us peons, but it has fun with it. And I think everybody's kind of laughing at each other in this movie and that's the best way to experience it while having an absurd idea that while you think something's a certain way for the end, like you, you think, oh, maybe this is just bullshit. They go directly into the absurdity of it all. If there were 31 movies like this, I'm curious to know if I would have this this high in 31 like-minded, silly horror movies. But due to the fact that there's some serious issues in these movies, this was such a nice change of pace for me. And the circumstance of me covering, or us, excuse me, us covering these 31 together is, as far as I'm concerned, this is a welcome change of pace, more so even than two Jordan Peele movies. 10, which is Smile, and this kind of shocks me because this is another one of those movies that is miserable. It's, it's not a fun time. It deals with trauma and mental health and things that absolutely suck about feeling less than sane. And somehow it does that contagious horror thing the, the way old Japanese horror from the late 90s and early 2000s and it still kind of makes you entertained by the the seven days gimmick while also getting you to understand just how shitty dealing with certain mental health issues is and and putting a, a, a horrible scary face to it it's funny that we have something like truth or dare that just falls on its face and we now have two smile movies that have done that little gimmick the little smiley face thing and really hammered home with much fuller topic it's wild this is not a fun movie for me but because it was such a great time a full experience maybe not great i don't want to use the word great this movie sticks with me for wrong reasons and i, I i've got to respect that it's not one that i particularly enjoy but i certainly respect it Number nine, Abigail. Hey, back to fun silliness. There was the idea that a couple of months ago that you don't reveal the fact that the girl's a vampire in the trailer. And I think there's a way to do it. It's not that big a deal. The whole conflict of the movie is the fact that she's a vampire and, and you, you guys are really, really outmatched. Melissa Barrera, awesome work. And for as much as people are talking about other actors being, you know, modern scream queens, Melissa Barrera is quite a good showing here. And Abigail, right on for making a movie with a with a, a kid that's playing a vampire. I like it when films respect, I don't know, child actors, because I don't know what I'm trying to say, but this felt like a kid who was able to play around and not be a kid on set. I, I, I don't know what I'm trying to say fun time where this this ballerina girl just completely plays with her food and again in different lists what i have at this high i, I don't know 
but fun matters to me. Rewatchability matters to me, and this is top 10 rewatchability for me. Todo peinado porque no me dio tiempo nada a ponerme la chancla y el bañador. Voy a la playa, había subido la marea. Eso. Eso. Había subido la marea con triple paella. Titan. It seems like I'm I'm going serious, goofy, serious, goofy. But Titan. Ooh, man, the French Julia de Corno has has kind of said a lot in the two films that I've seen. And this is another movie that I wouldn't say is horror, but deals with loss in a similar way that something like Smile does. Other movies where you know have having to deal with certain trauma sucks. And this isn't really something I would call fun, but people who have dealt with like-minded issues might find this interesting. It's unfortunate that the gimmick of a car and woman relations are part of this movie. I realize at this point that no matter what I say, I'm not gonna sound normal. I respect this movie. When you've seen as many French extremist movies as I have, this feels like a romantic drama. Number seven is Pearl. Holy shit, who knew we would have had a Wizard of Oz-esque film on a 31 for as much as X just shocked me. Pearl, you think about the fact that Pearl was shot the same time, like just to kill time because they were stuck during COVID. How do you nail something like this? like in between shoots this movie's awesome the film fan in me really digs a lot of what's happening in this movie maybe if i wasn't so attached to movie watching and, and hollywood the way i am this wouldn't feel so fan filmy to hollywood in general it this movie is fun to watch and it's something that i certainly go back to a lot and to have it mirror x a bunch. Another element that I don't like or ha was disappointed with Maxine is X and Pearl. There are moments that certainly rhyme and feel parallel in those two movies and that's not so much the case in Maxine. Having seen X, you appreciate certain things that, that happen and that are mirrored in Pearl and done with this different look. I really, really was surprised by both X and Pearl, but Pearl especially because of the way they delivered this story. Number six, Get Out. Oh, yet another film that is a bit more serious than it is fun. I can't remember if this movie came out before all the the W word that rhymes with broke was, was a big thing, but I feel like as far as society is concerned, this movie's important the class dynamics are certainly there i guess race and class dynamics are are prevalent in this movie again something that that feels like something we've seen before but it has such a wild twist to it and it it is entertaining and knows when to crack a joke while dealing with rather serious subject matter it feels like something we're familiar with but at the same time it is really captivating it, it, it's it's in this list, it's so funny. There's some serious things, there's some fun things, and this is quite serious, but it, it manages to balance both. And when it pokes a joke every now and again, it, it it's like this release of tension where you're like, now let me re-screw my head back on. Fantastic work, considering what Jordan Peele has done since then. I don't know if his name should be so synonymous with brilliant filmmaking the way some of these other filmmakers we've discussed here aren't, but it can only help if if someone is trying to carry the whole of the horror community. The top five, Exorcism of Emily Rose is a movie that I feel like, I don't know about you guys, I feel like I take it for granted and in re-watching it, you just lose track of just how many like-minded movies there have been. Like Exorcism of Blank 
I mean, how many Russell Crowe exorcism movies have there been in the last? I know it's only like two, but it just seems like every year there's some sort of exorcism of this. Exorcism make-believer. But this, The Exorcism of Emily Rose, is a movie that manages to cover all of the bases and does so rather well. It's one of the thrillers with benefits type deal where it, it's got some pretty scary scares and it's still reserved enough to just be scary, just thrilling for a Silence of the Lambs type audience. That's where I feel like the horror genre loses track with something like this. Every time they try to do some sort of exorcism movie, it doesn't balance the drama as well as the horror and thrills. And Exorcism of Emily Rose is like a stellar movie. I'm actually kind of shocked that Jennifer Carpenter of Dexter fame didn't surface much. Uh, I mean, she was in Dexter, of course, but since this movie, there was the Wreck remake, but I don't know, maybe that's that's lost potential, but every now and again, there are movies that are like really stealth and they catch you by surprise with just how surprisingly great they are. And Exorcism of Emily Rose is, it's awesome. I, I feel like this movie's underrated as far as the public is concerned, but it's it's number five for me. Number four is Hereditary. The beatdown of our will to live continues. It's weird because I know that this year was supposed to be the cashing Brian's ass in check on the Terrifier franchise, but I didn't get the memo that I was going to be traumatized during this entire 31. It didn't hit me, but at least 10 of these movies have some angle of suicide or it just dreary, just awful, not wanting to be alive, looking to camera while they slice their own face. So while the world knows that Cody said, piss off, Brian, we're doing Terrifier. The films that we have is essentially Cody saying, Sipo, get fucked. We're doing trauma and suicide. <laughs> Hereditary is a very, very good movie. There are a lot of movies on this list that capture trauma and being miserable and depressed rather well. And Hereditary, for the best reasons, for the worst reasons, it is brilliant what they do with this movie. There are moments where the audio does the work. There are moments where reactions, acting shots, everything takes a different corner. There, there's drama, there's irony. There's, there's so many different elements of Hereditary that suck. When I say suck, I mean, uh, just get you to understand just, just how brutal and dramatic this movie is. And it's, it's fantastic. And not very often do I get to say that this movie's incredible. I don't ever want to see it again. But Hereditary, it's along those like Schindler's List. These movies where, yeah, they're they're spectacular. But yeah, I'm I'm all, I'm all set on on that emotion now. Thank you. Great job. Please never call me again. Number three for me. Again, this could be recency bias, but it's Alien Romulus. It checked every single box for me. For those of you who are familiar, Alien, the original, is my number one in the franchise, and it was number one in my Monsters and Machines 31 on 31. Another thing about the Alien franchise is I really like Prometheus. I don't hate what they gave us in that movie and a half. And for this movie to look fantastic, balance practical effects, and still manage to get a bunch of people who have different reasons to be invested in this to check so many different boxes and somehow cover all of these areas like a romantic fan film would and do so efficiently with the exception of some cg spectacular work the no gravity scene is just thrilling and that's without even using any xenomorphs or anything it's it's just a tense scene so many parallels so many rhythm to the Alien franchise. And again, I, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm being way too nice to this, but I don't know if there was any other way to approach this while mentioning various other parts of the franchise and manage to do all of it and achieve a decent enough story without doing CG. 
Very well. But then again, you think about what could be better. And if you thought of giant Y-shaped vagina, man, there's no topping that. Number two for me is X. I absolutely love this movie. I love both X and Pearl was just flabbergasted at how out of left field this movie caught us. And the fact that we were all home for COVID when this happened, it was a bit of a blessing. This movie looks, feels a bit like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It looks, it feels like your typical old slasher movie. It looks and feels like something that has a bit more to say, covering a couple of things that are popular in the horror world i.e. porn. Kid Cuddy with that tripod. God bless. There's so much in this movie that if you don't want to look too deep in it, it, it's just a straightforward slasher. But if you're interested and want something more from this movie, cinematography, the choice of music, the dialogue in cases, really shocking and fantastic work. It's because of this movie, X, that something like Maxine would be a bit of a letdown for me. I think if I knew Ty West's past and just walked into Maxine blind, I would feel a lot better about that movie. But due to the fact that X just nailed so many love letters to me, the slasher fan, and then Pearl does that and goes even further with love letters to movies, the Don't Fear the Reaper scene, if you tell me on paper that that they're going to do Don't Fear the Reaper and they're going to have a kill scene to it. On principle, I would object to the idea of it, but watching it, that is a brilliant, brilliant scene. The use of color, the use of blood, the apt use of that song, just spectacular work. And this could go higher for me in the future, even though I don't think we're ever going to do this 31. So that leaves my number one, Julia DeCorno's Raw. I guess if you suggest something for the batch, it's kind of a rite of passage to have one of them in the number one spot. Brian, Raw is to horror as Inception is to action for me. Uh, there is a lot more going on to Raw. I feel much smarter when I watch this movie, I only think I feel like it's smarter because it's a different language. There's social commentary. There's some commentary on a, a few things. The French really know how to get our attention and try really hard to be edgelords. On top of that, it's a good movie. It's it's beautiful. It's, it's well-paced, flashy. Rarely are there foreign language films that I just am all about, but Raw is something, go back to the year it came out, I think it was 2017. I was all about this movie, and seeing it again this last summer, nothing has changed for me. I, I am so about this movie. I love it when horror movies can feel a bit more, forgive the term, classy. If you're able to handle dialogue that is in a different language, if you're able to handle subtitles, uh, give Raw a, a whirl, because there's a lot more to that than just some good storytelling the the gore is pretty good it's it's french they like to fuck with our minds with their art raw has constantly been at the top of my lists since it came out in 2017 so that's this year's 31 what do you have in your 31 do me a favor comment down below let me know how your 31 plays out what of these directors would you have swapped out there's a bit of turmoil behind some of that you'll probably get all of that tea on the night of the debrief which knowing what i know right now about brian myself cody rudy i'm not very in tune with what sean's rankings are at the moment but i may not be the only one jousting with Brian for the debrief, you may want to be around for that. <laughs> Obviously, a special thank you to my executive producers and producers on my Patreon. Shout out to them. Link down below if you'd like to support the channel and get access to things that they had access to weeks before this video went up. And otherwise, a comment, like, subscribe, share, say hi. Uh, vote me as your favorite 
we'll just say person. Your favorite person. Not even on YouTube, just period. I don't know how to end this. It's weird being on time. I've been Charles, otherwise known as CPO. You haven't. <laughs> <laughs>